Across America, there are 55 million children in school today, kindergarten through high school, and nearly four million of them attend a faith-based school, a school operated by a religion or a faith group. People who choose to send their children to faith-based institutions uh, have the belief that that institution mirrors what they believe in the home. The fabric of American education really is broader than the public school system. Parents deserve the right to have the choice of what kind of education their children get. One of the largest faith-based school systems belongs to the Seventh-day Adventists. Adventists are a Christian faith grounded in the Bible who operate nearly a thousand mostly smaller schools. In all grades and in all subjects, students in Adventist schools performed above the national average. The schools all follow a blueprint for education designed by the church's principal visionary, Ellen White. That blueprint, authored more than a century ago, calls for the teaching of the whole child, body, mind, and spirit. What I feel is the advantage in this school is that we don't have to teach in a spiritual vacuum. From the beginning, Ellen White insisted on what at the time was a novel idea. Curriculum organization is very much set by her and emphasizes the needs for students to have practical training, to be able to be prepared for careers, in fact, for jobs, as well as stimulating the mind. And that becomes what Adventists often call the blueprint for Adventist education. A blueprint for education that calls for teaching the whole child with a focus on skill training, healthy living, and community service. And sometimes it has to be done in an environment where the first concern is the very safety of the student. I take two trains and one bus. It takes about 30 to 20 minutes. I don't get nervous as much. Well, I used to, like, when I was in, like, the third grade or the fifth grade, because I got holed up once. They just, like, grabbed and just ran. It's really a tough neighborhood. Anything can happen to them. Some of them have been held up. Gangs in the area have uh, attacked them. Shootings, many times we have had, but our students have been protected. They have been safe. I've had students come in here crying because someone got shot and killed in their building, for example. I find them crying here. And, and, and then you, you mean that person we just heard in the news? Yes. And then they, we have to slow down, we have to take time to talk to them because if they're troubled, if they're troubled over something that, that happened in their environment or at home, they can't learn. Because they, they see the harsh realities, they actually think deeper, I think. You know, like you're talking to them and, and, and they can reason in a deeper way. They, they, they don't see the world artificial. They see good and bad for what it is. What can you do to help solve family problems? I make too much noise. And what does your mother say? You stop making too much noise. Because right. it's nighttime, so some people are sleeping. Uh, okay, so they are a reflection of what they see and what they live and experience at home. I would say that 80% of them come from uh, broken families. They live with one parent, mostly the mother. Even when, when we speak about family values and parents and father and mother, you can see their sad faces at times. Okay. If I can do something about solving any issue in their environment, I think it's my, my duty uh, as a teacher. Actions, very good, yes. Good teachers have a feeling, these are my children, and, and I have a responsibility to them that goes beyond, way beyond, downloading information. I'm always amazed at private school teachers and the sacrifices that they make. Teachers in the Adventist system and in private schools in general, almost never make what uh, a public school teacher would make. This is Amirelis, and this is her second day of school. 
So she is having separation anxiety from her parents and I saw her in the classroom, she was crying and I took her with me to the office. I'm walking around with her to, so that she feels comfortable. That was the last one. What they usually do, Good morning, eighth graders. How are you this morning? Good. It's great. You may be seated. Students learn to be respectful and uh, not only respecting the uh, teacher, the principal, but respecting each other, being accepting of each other's cultures and differences. Well, when I first came here, I thought um, everybody was gonna be uptight. And I was the only person who was Muslim. And when I thought about it, I was like, wow. I'm really here, but nobody's treating me different. I'm like a anger issue girl, so when I when people get me mad, I can't control myself, so I just have to do something for them to live, to leave me alone or not do the same thing again. She had so many problems on the bus, bullying so many of the students and some of her own classmates. No pushing, no pushing. In the school where she came from, she was throwing chairs across the room. She threw a desk. Uh, across the room and uh, hit a teacher. You shut up, who's talking to you? Her parents were uh, constantly going to school because of her behavior problems. And with Ms. Romeo, she was talking to me how to make a change and my body language, now not to talk with the attitude. She has helped me a lot. More minutes, just calm down, okay, relax. One of the more effective ways they worked with Dalyani was through the use of a behavior journal. After each journal as she wrote, I spoke to her that she can make a choice to change this problem. Before, she always wanted to beat people up, and now she doesn't. We're more a close-knit type of group, and um, she felt that we cared about her and that we didn't want to fight with her on a constant basis or argue with her and that we really cared. Me and Ms. Matos don't just stand each other. We both like Hello Kitty. <laughs> we found a common bond in that. Yeah. <laughs> Little victories. Uh, like, uh, it doesn't happen overnight. You have to um, be persistent and endure. <laughs> you have to have a lot of endurance, not only on the part of the student, but on the part of the teacher, and not give up. But the notion of school as sanctuary is not just for the inner city. This ancient and sacred land in Arizona is part of the Navajo Indian Reservation, the largest reservation in the United States. Life on the reservation is challenging. Unemployment is four times the national average, and gangs are a constant threat. For more than 60 years, Holbrook Indian Academy, a Seventh-day Adventist boarding school, has been offering safe haven for Navajo students, dating back to a time when earlier missionaries were leaving their mark. In the past, churches have been chosen to take certain reservations and Christianize them or civilize them. And so the civilization that they bring to the Native people has been one that has not been good. They believe that they needed to take the Indian out of the Indian. There's the reservation life, and then there's there's the American culture. Like there's two worlds that you have to try and figure out an identity between. I always felt like because of coming from the reservation, because my skin was darker, because I was Native American, that I was less than everybody else. All right, ladies, it is now 6 a.m. You have one hour left to finish getting ready for school. A lot of the girls come with issues. They don't have parents don't have dads, a lot of them come from abusive homes. I want to help them figure out that they are not less than everybody else. That the color of our skin doesn't mean anything. Sam Hubbard teaches Navajo language and culture at Holbrook. TVs, the music, all that stuff that's coming in is totally uh, changing our culture. Part of my job, I guess, is to, to say you're Navajo, be proud of who you are. I think it's important because right now people say, are saying that we're losing our traditions, our language, and it's dying because 
nobody wants to really learn it on the reservations. I want to um, learn it to keep it going and to teach my children. Part of preserving Native culture means devoting school time to creating Native works of art and learning the skill of horseback riding. Some of our students come from some fairly difficult backgrounds and so by helping them learn to relate to the animals, it can help them learn to relate to people. When you think about taking an animal that weighs maybe a thousand pounds and, and they obey you and respond to you, then that helps instill a lot of confidence. I never rode before. I was pretty scared, but I got used to it. Being on the reservation, there's a lot of teen pregnancy and um, young children already being into drugs and being here at this school helps because I don't have people trying to persuade me into doing drugs. The kids sometimes don't stay long here. We know that we have a lot that we have to do and pack into that short period of time. Then what happens is that our children begin to have to take care of their families at home and it's hard for them to be here at school. Something happened today that really broke me down. My mom called me and she said that she's moving out and that she doesn't want to deal with us anymore. I can't change my mom's mind. I know that I'm not done with school yet. I'm kind of worried about how I can still succeed in life and pay the house bills and everything because most of the support is being put on me now and I know that I can do it. Families are important. You know, try to see, try to help them maybe they don't make the same mistakes uh, a lot of us have made. So it's just vital for us to raise the kids, to educate them on how to have a happy and successful marriage and home, both financially, spiritually, emotionally. We want these kids to go back to the reservation, live good lives, and to change the future. I was on the Honor Society all through high school here, and I got baptized while I was here. Decided I was gonna go to college while I was here, and what I wanted to be, that I wanted to come back, because I had completely changed my life. You know, I found an identity, a self-worth here. I became myself here. One of the unfortunate things that's going on in our society is that we are blaming teachers for problems whose real origins are in poverty. When you've got 25% of American school children showing up at school hungry, it's really, really hard to create an orderly classroom full of deep learning. Our cafeteria is very small. We can only fit one grade per lunch period. Entonces los niños les gusta, nosotros aquí, como somos adventistas, no, no, no utilizamos ningún tipo de carne. Nos proponemos enseñarle a los niños una dieta vegetariana, que es más saludable para ellos. And what's in it? I don't know. I don't, I guess there's pig, I don't know. Pig? Do you think the school would serve you, you a hot dog with pig in it? No. So what do, what do you think is in it? Vegetarian or hot dog? What does that mean, vegetarian hot dog? Something that, oh. that is organic. There's no meat in it. Not that much meat in it. That it doesn't have that much meat. And it, it doesn't have pork or like chicken. It has just like vegetables. Vegetables. But it's good. Our students that are um, come here, whether it's in the third grade, fourth, fifth, sixth, whatever grade, many of them can't read. I came to the school in the third grade and my reading level was like low, like to the ground. The teacher in the third grade worked with him. Every day after school, he was, the teacher would work with him. Miss Sanchez, she helped me when I was in the third grade read better. When I was in fourth grade, I was reading pretty good. And yeah, that teacher, she's like a second mom to me. Hello, my name is Abe Lincoln. I was born in 1809. Ask not what your country can do for you. 
ask what you can do for your country. Was seven into forty-eight went how many times? Um, wait, I know this one. Seven times. Yes, because seven times seven is 49. All you got to do is have, subtract We have 48. We have 48. Yeah, so it's okay, closer. So, like, after school, they will go, like, keep drilling you and drilling you until you get it. Yeah. Well, we the isolated variable. You have to minus it. What I feel is the advantage in this school is that we don't have to teach in a spiritual vacuum. We can answer two basic questions that they all have as to why I was born, why am I, am I here, uh, where am I going? I see bad things and I just walk. Like if I see somebody like getting hit or something, I'm just like walk the other way. Like. Or if I see somebody fighting, I just walk the other way because they might do it to me. He is one of these children who would never see you without saying hello and shaking your hand. I try, and all the teachers here try for them to catch a vision of a future, because I feel like if they have a clear vision of the future, then they can say no to the negative that comes their way. And part of that vision is realized through community service projects, like an annual lunch for senior citizens. And we're planning to have any, every senior citizen and every other person to come attend our school and have a full lunch. We're doing this because we like to give back to the community after our community has given so much to us. It's just such a joy for them to go out into our neighborhood and invite someone to come to the school to share. They are so proud of our school. Oh, they all can't wait to take the seniors around the school and show them our school. A century after the blueprint was created, science is confirming how important it is to create a positive environment for learning. For more than 20 years, Jay Geed of the National Institute of Mental Health has been studying brain patterns in children and adolescents. The ability to learn and to acquire skills is really breathtaking. Um, and it isn't something that uh, stops at age 16 or 18 or 21. We continue to be able to learn throughout our lives, but there are certain periods of developmental windows when the environment really has, um, has a, a great impact. When the brain changes around the time of puberty, we become much more social. The brain becomes very attuned to uh, peers, um, to the social world around us. And this has profound implications for moral decision making. If you were in school and you saw some students who you didn't know getting beat up by some bullies, what would you do? I would go grab an adult and explain the situation. So the, the neurobiology tells us that the adolescent brain is going to be very good at learning and adapting to the environment. But it doesn't tell us to what environment it should adapt to. In a sense, that's what education is. For the young person, it's not only what they're taught, but how they're taught that can create a lasting impression. Outdoor education and nature is good stuff. Every kid from New York City to Durango, Colorado, wired to be outside and to appreciate nature. Does anybody know what a lynx's uh, main source of food during the winter is? Uh, rabbit, no rabbit. Snowshoe hair. So Mr. Adam Marbled and the state teacher and I work together to make sure that the outdoor education pieces correlate with what we're learning in the classroom and then they get to really experience it outside in the wilderness, which brings a whole new meaning to what we learn about in the classroom. We took as a motto, creative education that honors the creator, that children are inherently linked with nature because we are created by God and were created in His image. And the students from Columbine Christian School, the Adventist School in Durango, Colorado, try to honor creation by going out each year on Earth Day to clean the banks of the river that runs through their city. 
basically here to clean up trash for the community, this community service thing. And we found tons of really obscure things. I found a skateboard last year. And what'd you do with it? I kept it. Longest piece of trash. Woo! Can you see that? That's a long piece of trash. <laughs> Woo! Good job. Uh, Columbine has about 97 students from preschool to eighth grade. Each classroom is a multi-grade classroom, so it's first and second together, third and fourth together, fifth and sixth together, and seventh and eighth together. Turns out, research tells us that the one-room schoolhouse and that approach of having uh, younger students mixed is really powerful because the first year they come in, they learn the teacher, they learn the setting, they're learning how to function in that classroom, and the teacher is, is getting to know them as well. They enter as learners their first year, and then the second year they're with that teacher, they become the leaders, and the teacher really needs them to become leaders. It's easier to teach one grade, it's better for the students if you have multi-age. It, it gives you more responsibilities. A lot, I mean, a lot of the time you're asked to help people around the room. It does impact how you work. And the first thing you notice when you walk in is that these are not your typical classrooms. We don't need to make this be sterile. It doesn't need to be desks in a row and a white wall. It needs to be something that really speaks of God. To us, what speaks of God is nature. So we bring nature. We've got wasps' nests hanging around. We have trees in the classroom. Somehow bringing nature into the classroom also brings something sacred in there. And so it's the relationship between the, the four pieces. And, and if you don't help that relationship along to work together, then you're not going to get a fire. There's a lot of social studies wrapped into this. I mean, this is the way that um, primitive peoples all over the world made fire. Um, and so it's fun that when we go in and visit a museum, um, the kids are like, oh, wow, they recognize those tools. And they, they not only recognize them, they know how they work. Um, and then they have a respect, I think, for the difficulty that goes into the, the process, too. I think in most schools, you can't, you know, play with knives and, well, not play, but um, <laughs> carve and just do all this fun stuff in the usual school, I guess. Yeah, right on. Give it another big blow. You need another big blow. We fell upon a methodology, um, really quite accidentally, called place-based education. Because what is in soil that those oh, plants nutrients. need? Nutrients. What else do we need? We need space, soil, good soil. Water, what else do we need? Oh, place Based education by nature is very okay, multidisciplinary. So the idea is to bring in reading and writing and research with what they've actually experienced for themselves outside. Do you see your first little line on your finger? Yeah, I was first thinking that line? deep. Yeah. yeah, let's go that deep. We get to learn about like the wilderness more. We're not like always sitting in chairs all day doing all these tests. The fish species that we're raising are round-tailed chubs. Um, they are native species to Colorado, um, to our local river, the Animus here. And so we've connected with the Colorado Division of Wildlife, who's given us the fish and the tanks. And the kids raise them, we monitor them, we feed them. We need to get 10 drops of bottle one from the nitrate. We monitor um, pH levels, ammonia levels, um, nitrate levels, and then log that, and then turn that back into the Division of Wildlife. They're an inch and a half to two inches, and they'll get up to be football size if they, if they can live you know, their full life expectancy. The kids will go through the process of um, climatizing the fish to the river water temperatures. They'll monitor some water levels, um, chemical levels of the water, comparing that to what they've been observing in the classroom. And then one by one, they'll let them go. The kids are involved in playing games related to the fish. Um, they're role-playing basically different um, aquatic invertebrate species. Um, and so they help helps them understand kind of the life cycle of what's happening. Uh, I'm a rat-tailed magnet, maggot, and he is very um, tolerant to pollutants. Which means what? That if, like, if there was like an oil spill, that he could still live in a river that's very polluted.
I feel kind of happy that they're gonna be free. Kind of not fun because they're not in the classroom anymore. And you, and sometimes you kind of worry about them because there's so much danger for them out there. I'm gonna miss them because we've been taking care of them the whole year. <laughs> you become a teacher of students rather than a teacher of curriculum. I think that's really important. At one time, we, there were 50 students or more. Right now, it's nine. So unless we let others around us know the great possibilities that there is for their child here, we will eventually die. There is a cultural change in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. 40 years ago, if you were um, an Adventist family, it was very likely for your children to go to an Ab the Adventist school, the local church school. I mean, it was almost a scandal if you didn't. That's not the case today. And so our church uh, pretty heavily subsidizes the school. We give about half of our operating budget to the school. And I think that's pretty common throughout the, the Adventist world. Is there more water in here? Yeah. Would that make a difference if you had more of something hot? Yeah. yeah. Ellen White gave counsel that if there are six children in a church, that church should have a school. And so there are many churches that will have a small church school even today. And in that church school, because of the number of children, they may have multi-grade classrooms. It's just a practicality. All right. Many parents are afraid that they will, their child will not get the same quality of education in a small school. To Classroom make their size was one of several concerns Adventists were hearing about their schools. There was a decline in enrollment, and then there was a decline in confidence. That is, parents were not as confident as they used to be about whether or not Adventist education was delivering quality academics. And we had no hard data. So to gather that data, they combined both the standardized Iowa test now known as the Iowa Assessments, and a cognitive ability test designed to show a student's projected level of achievement. They called the study Cognitive Genesis. Over four consecutive years, more than 52,000 students in more than 800 Adventist schools took the test. We tested every child in third grade through ninth grade and 11th grade across the U.S., Canada, and Bermuda. Think about the fact that we are an extremely diverse church with an extremely diverse population. So one of the really unique things about this is the longitudinal nature of the study and the fact that it was essentially a population sample. There wasn't just a handful of schools. They, they actually got just about everybody to participate. And that's unique. Uh, as near as we can tell, it is several million students a year who take the Iowa assessments. So these days when one administers the Iowa assessments, not only can um, one find out how the children uh, in your school did uh, compared to the nation, but also how well they're advancing along to mastery for that level of Common Core State standards. In all grades and in all subjects, students in Adventist schools performed above the national average. And the Cognitive Abilities Test showed that children in Adventist schools were performing beyond their expected level and improved with every year. To the extent that kids are actually becoming more able to reason about unfamiliar problems, that's a, a really important outcome, I think, especially in a world that's ever-changing. We came up with uh, characteristics of students uh, that correlate with high achievement, such as reading just for pleasure, having positive friends, good communication with parents, um, students who ate well, who slept at least eight or more hours, and who exercised. Those students had higher achievement. Do you see a man students who identified themselves as being spiritual 
and who were interested in spiritual things, those students had higher achievement. The cognitive genesis study actually shows that there is a, a higher performance of students in small schools. There is no academic advantage for being in a, in a large school, despite the fact that many parents say, well, I don't want my children going to a small school. I want them to go to a, a large school where they have a science teacher and they move from classroom to classroom. That's not what the research is showing. Sine of theta squared plus cosine of theta squared is equal to one. That was the main trig identity that we have to learn, right? Our students generally score as classroom averages in the 80th to 90th percentile as a, as a classroom. Uh, we see that from year to year. The unit circle, the basic equation that comes from it, x squared plus y squared equals one. And we have just around 350 students uh, split, not quite evenly, about 165 students in the high school and 185 in the elementary. The majority of our students live within 45 minutes of the school and then we have 15 to 20 percent of our students that live outside of an, an hour of the school. And there's a small handful that commute over two hours to be here. One way. Good morning, Griffins. Good morning. Good to see you. All is well. The same ones are grumpy every morning. The same ones are smiling. The same ones give you a hug. It's pretty consistent. Parents have to not only pay their taxes to the public school system and support the public school system, but they also then have to come up with additional dollars to pay the tuition at private school. More and tell me. I have found that kids learn in a lot of different ways, but the key component through all of those learning styles is having a healthy relationship with the teacher. Peggy Kuzma, what is this? Without a significant relationship, there's no significant learning. What is heat? Heat is a kind of energy, like sound and light. You may not always see heat, but you sure can feel it. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Put it in your face. It's burning hard. But many animals. I work with each of the classroom teachers to coordinate what we're doing in here. And so there's more interaction probably between uh, what I do in here and with the classrooms. You find things that give off heat. Right. Yeah, practical education has certainly changed over time. Um, the idea of, of teaching the students useful trades um, was, was a very core part of what we did. As we've moved into an information society and are in an information society, we have to make those adjustments as a school system and take the concept of teaching the st students to be involved and engaged and just shift it to um, the, the no, modern world. This one first. Okay. No, wait. Yeah, yeah. To do degrees. degrees. <laughs> <laughs> it's working. <laughs> it's working, yeah. Now what was this program called? Follow a line. Line, line. okay. They're seeing a toy become technology. I love that part of it. Uh, they're also having to problem solve. It doesn't always work the first time. They have to go back, try again. We'll put the blue ball here, and then it'll go up slowly to the blue one and see that it's blue, and then it'll stop and back up. And then we'll switch it with the red one, and then it comes up and hits it. Yes! It worked. Every push, every move, be to your glory always. In your name we pray. Amen. The most important approach that I see in our Adventist system collectively is that we teach to the whole person. The student's life in the classroom and beyond the classroom is really intermingled among the social, the spiritual, and the academic. Great things happening in our school. Please bless our, bless our school and bless everybody here. Amen. Amen. As a kid, you know, one of the most frustrating things in the world is to hear one thing at home, I'm hearing something else at school, I'm hearing something else, you know, at church, and I have to sit there and sort out all of what is true or right.
What does having God as creator imply about my worth and value as a human being? What does that imply about my perspective of the earth, my stewardship or care of it? What does that imply about the design and the, and the features that I find in the world as I study chemistry, as I study physics, as I study biology? What if I am viewing that through the lens of God as creator, what value, what meaning, what purpose does that have? And then what is my responsibility as an individual to be involved with that? In our science curriculum, we wrestle with creation and evolution. Uh, we don't we don't run from the concept of evolution. We we look at it. Probably 10 or 15 years ago, in any Adventist school, to have even talked about evolution would have been a problem for a teacher. But now, as as educators, we we really and we'll stand firm on the idea that 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 dialogue needs to occur. The students in Adventist schools score considerably above the national average in science. And this is surprising to some people because the Adventist curriculum is based upon the idea that God is creator, and so creation is a theme that runs throughout the curriculum. Some critics would say or assume that good science can't be taught within such a context. Well, that's not what the results of that test show. When we go out and gather data, we use the same approach to gathering evidence that others do. We use the same laboratory methods for analyzing our data. The difference is the questions we ask. Leonard Brand is a professor of biology and paleontology at Loma Linda University in Southern California. Just off the university campus is Loma Linda Academy for elementary through high school. So these high school students will often have guest lecturers especially around hot-button topics like creationism and evolution. Naturalism is the idea that there have never been any miracles. This is what many scientists follow. Uh, this worldview that says there have never been any supernatural, no miracles. Uh, this is the most common scientific worldview today. My worldview, it would be considered a minority view because I do believe in a creator God. Very emotional tension in the scientific community over this issue of creation and evolution. And I really think a lot of the, of the passion comes because of the political battle over what will be taught in public schools. In the world in which we're educating our children, you generally will have people who are looking for evolution only, and you will have people sometimes in the church side who are looking for creation only. But we have found that with our professional teachers and uh, the resources of our community, that we're able to develop our students into critical thinkers, good scientists with good scientific method, who also understand the paradigm of how you can be a good scientist and be a believer in God. All right, class, class? Yes, yes! All right, I think we're about ready, so let's see which groups are cleared off. They can go to the worship. The second graders are really concrete still in the way that they think. They're not thinking about deep, abstract ideas. They're really focused on the here and now, what's happening. It's a time that they're growing a lot and they're learning a lot, so their mind's just really fresh and really open to absorb anything that comes their way. And so it's a really impressionable time, I think. Now, what kind of heroes are we doing? Yeah. American heroes. American heroes, right? For kids, they really want to have a hero. They want to have someone they can believe in, they can uh, model their life after. And some of these heroes are really good examples for these kids. I chose um, Jane Addams. I'm drawing her because we're making portraits. And the reason I chose her is because, because my mom's a, um, a social worker and, she, and uh, Jane Addams started social work. So, and, but my mom didn't actually really come up with the idea. My dad actually did. That means we should not be afraid even during hard times. Any hard times for you yet? Oh, yes. Quite a few. My sister is so annoying. Oh. You know, 
oranges for something else, save the juice. And for Adventists, considered by many to be some of the healthiest people on the planet, class time is dedicated to the importance of good nutrition. Because one of the things that we're doing in this class is to give you information, because that's going to help you make better choices when you eat. We talk about treating your body as a gift. God gave you this gift, and when you destroy it by behavior or food or bad choices, all of those kinds of things, it all plays in together. As much as I learn about life and like math and all these good things, I could only enjoy it if I'm a full, healthy person and able to understand those. You know, if I have a healthy diet, then I can focus more, my brain's functioning much clearer. How many of you are vegetarian? A lot of the students originally made vegetarian choices or other healthful living choices because of their parents, but they own it now themselves as teenagers. Uh, are you Seventh-day Adventist? Yes. Are you vegetarian? Yes. I'm a pescatarian. I eat fish. The Seventh-day Adventist Church formed in America in the 1860s, and over the next decades, began opening schools across the country. Education in mid-19th century America was in the midst of fundamental change. Traditionally, education had been all about being educated in the classics. Greek and Roman authors uh, learning the original languages and learning a relatively circumscribed body of specific texts. In the course of the 19th century, ideas of education changed very considerably. Adventist education is really a part of that. For Adventists, the Greeks and Romans were considered pagan authors, steeped in polytheism and mythology. So instead, they would emphasize the Bible. A unique school system began to unfold. And then, of course, Ellen White, uh, she was a champion and an advocate for black people and black education in the church like few people know. And she was way ahead of her time. It was Ellen White's son, Edson, who took the bold step in the education of blacks in the South with the building of a boat, the Morning Star. So him and another guy build a boat in Lake Allegan up in, in Michigan, sail it down the Allegan River across Lake Michigan, uh, over through a couple of canals into the Mississippi, take this thing down into the state of Mississippi. Uh, into a place where uh, white people helping black people are not welcome. Edson knew that if he stayed in one place, he would have been tarred, he may have been lynched, hurt, murdered, who knows what would have happened. So the concept of the Morning Star boat going from place to place on the Yazoo River, he was cutting edge for his time. My grandmother's family was living and working on a plantation at the time. They became aware of the boat and that there were services there. could go there for reading instruction and for Bible teaching. And they would say they heard the singing from worships that were held on the boats in the evening coming across the water, across the Mississippi. So from that little boat, the Morning Star boat, all of these people wound up here at Oakwood. And there were 16 students in the school, the first class, and my mother was one of the 16. At one point in time, Oakwood trained 95% of the pastors, African-American pastors, that work in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Today, Oakwood Academy, adjacent to Oakwood University, has a grade school and a high school that is still very much a family tradition. Attention! Good morning, boys and girls. Good morning, My father attended. He had graduated in the 40s. About 30 years later, I came and graduated in the early 70s. And my three siblings through the 70s and the 80s in the 90s, two of my sons graduated from Oakwood Academy, and today I have a grandson who's just starting first grade in the Oakwood Academy. So our DNA is connected to Oakwood Adventist Academy.
simple terms, what does biology, what is the definition for biology? Everybody, what is it? The study of life. I came here in 1976 and graduated. I've taught here since 1992. I really enjoyed coming back to Oakwood Evidence Academy because I sat right over there many years ago and then I got a chance to give back to the students. So that's the mission here, to give back. One of our core values is community service. To prepare students for a lifetime of service, each quarter we have community service days. We're trying to help people who don't have a whole lot of things, food, clothes, anything, to just try to reach out to people and give them what they need. When we have taken them particularly directly hands-on to places where they can touch the homeless or talk to the homeless, they begin to appreciate what they have, you know, and they come back and say, God, I don't need to complain as much. I'm extremely privileged because there are some people who don't have anything to eat, who don't have anything, who are out in the streets, and this is a good source, a good way to help them to get back on their feet and give them something to eat. Students begin building habits early in life, and if we want them to have a lifetime of being involved in their communities, having community involvement at all levels, they have to begin at an early age. Therefore, we make this a part of our learning, and it's in our curriculum, and it is taught through the various classes. That needs to go all the way over to the other side. That whole self-image piece is very, very important. What they're going to get in a Seventh-day Adventist school is the idea that they were created by God, so therefore they are automatically of great value. Adventist education very much emphasized the Bible, but it also emphasized what today we would call vocational education, that education had to have a practical purpose. In the early years, practical purpose meant every Adventist school had its own industry, like a dairy farm that helps support the school and provide work opportunities for the students. Today, the dairy farms are mostly gone, but the idea of offering practical work experience remains. Welding is a big craft in the whole Navajo Nation. A lot of the Navajo people weld and actually are very known worldwide as being good welders. They're very artistic and very good welders. Most of the students probably won't go on to college or trade school, so we try to give them hands-on education as much as possible, something that they can go out and use. learning about the different parts of an engine and how um, we put it back together correctly. My mom was kind of like, why are you wasting your time and stuff? And I said, well, this is stuff that you can actually use in your real life. What I enjoy is seeing the pride that they have and when they've been able to learn something and accomplish something and how just the light bulb goes on inside their head and the feeling of confidence that they've been able to do this and figure it out for themselves. Well, I've worked in construction for about two years now, and we've learned to like just put the houses together from start to finish, um, from foundations to walls to roof to shingles. I work in the morning, and then I go to school in the afternoon, and the work helps me to pay off my school bill and also just gives me you know, more of a job security. Everybody's required to work. Regardless of your social economic standing, when you come to Fletcher Academy, you're going to work. It's not just about academics. And it's not just about learning how to do problems. Instead, it's how do you apply that knowledge to the real world. Fletcher is not an official Adventist school, but a private school run by Adventists using the Adventist blueprint. 
Well, we have four industries on campus that help to generate funds and also provide opportunities for our students to work and help pay their expenses. Um, one of them is a retail health food store. We also have an independent retirement center. And then we have an organization that is a fitness center. And then well, we also have a commercial laundry where a few of our students work. There are some elements that are the same where you go into Adventist education. We're looking at the mental, the physical, the spiritual. And here at Fletcher, we throw in the social. The point of education is not just to educate clever technicians. It's not just, today we would say, having plenty of marketable skills. It is to develop character, to develop integrity as individuals. If you have a good quality character person, I can teach you what I need you to know about our business. I'll teach you how to run the computers and our sales and our accounting. But if you don't have a good character, I can't teach you that. And so our focus on character, we think, is very important in preparing our students as they go out into the world. Push yourself hard for the next 15 minutes. You are counting on multiple people to accomplish a task. Teamwork goes in all aspects of life, and we try to teach that the things you learn here on the team are going to carry over for the rest of your life in all aspects of life. I was, I was terrified because when I saw the building, I was, I was like, what can I do here? Like, I, I'm not a very good construction worker. All I could do is basically run things back and forth. We're over here at the campsite working. Everybody's working so hard. We've cleared out all these materials over here. Well, the first couple days, all we did was clean, and then the cement came, and then you're mixing and pouring, and wheelbarrows are going in and out. It's a lot of work, but you don't feel tired because you're doing it for a good purpose. In order to move the heavy cinder blocks and not to pile all the work on one person, we made these block lines and passed the blocks down them one by one. We all gave each other a helping hand. It was not just one person taking the blocks to the side, but all of us helping one another, making the job a lot easier. At the end, we needed to paint the school after we had finished all we worked, so some of us climbed up on the roof and decided to trim the top wall. Work as hard as possible. It was the most strenuous work I've ever been through in my entire life. We're in here, we're talking to the students and making friends and having fun. Over here, we're so used to um, kids having so much, and over there, it's seeing that the kids don't really have anything at all. The school that we built was probably the central point of hope in their village, and it's humbled me and changed me forever to see the reactions on their faces and the impact that I left. A good school always creates a community of meaning and purpose. Uh, a good school is, is actually a community that, at its very best, a student would hate to graduate from. <laughs> when you have the home, the school, and the church working together as a group for the success of every kid in that school, how can you not have success? What a joyous time this is to see these young people graduate today. I think every human being has untapped potentials, and I think that the great opportunity in being a teacher is to be the miner who discovers that gold and brings it up and says, looky here, what you've got, and there's more of it in there. 
Um, I want to teach you how to mine it for yourself. Like, not that many people like make it successful from this neighborhood and stuff, but I think I'm really going to make successful. When Isai came here in the third grade, he could not read. Not a, no, he couldn't read. And what an accomplishment today. He's graduating with honors. Right? Yes. My mother was a single mom, as many parents are here. She put me in a private school with sacrifice. And I can relate to the parents that come, that bring their children to, to the school with sacrifice in the hopes that they can get something better. It's just incredible, unbelievable. The best feeling that you can possibly have, you know? No other job could give you such a fantastic feeling than to be working in a school. You, you hope that you influence a, a, a student like into the next year, our hope is to influence students for eternity.